Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so, welcome to the session on workspace adoption. And it's going to be a session on advice on onboarding people into a virtual workspace, but also something that you could take away from maybe your physical environments as well if you haven't moved away from them yet. So, more hybrid rather than just full virtualization. Um, so, I'm Kyle Davis. I'm a solutions architect for CDW. I'm actually employed to do workspace technologies. I'm a Citrix CTA, VMware V expert. I've got various accreditations and certifications covering most of the main workspace technologies. I've delivered um, solutions to customers ranging from a couple of hundred up to a couple of tens of thousands. Um, I'd like to think I've got some good things you can take away from this session. Uh, welcome questions afterwards if you, want, if you have anything that you want to put forward to me. Um, and if there's anything during the session, feel free as well. I've only got 15 minutes, so if there's anything quick, then just, just put your hand up. VMware disclaimer, quickly read that, one, two, three, done. My disclaimer, so <laughs> this is not specific to VMware or Citrix or Microsoft. This is going to cover a vast area of things very quickly. A lot of the points in this deck are valid for physical and virtual. Um, there are many in the market for the assessments as well. So even though the tools that I've used in this assessment, uh, which I'll show you shortly, there is other ones that can get this data as well. Um, data in this deck is all data from my home lab. So it's not necessarily going to be down to some customer data that I can't share and things like that. Um, and thoughts on my own, and they're not necessarily CDW's thoughts as well, just to put that one out there. Areas to be covered very quickly, planning, sizing, application compatibility at a very, very high level, user testing and onboarding, and some key takeaways that you can use for your own um, projects that you're moving on with. So a quick question, who's currently running a virtual workspace, whether that be VDI, server-based computing, Citrix, RDP, okay, three, four, five, six, seven. okay, there are a few of you then, that's fine. And are any of you planning to make any changes to it, implement more from a, a server-based computing environment to maybe a VDI, move more people from that environment? Okay, so a few as well. Perfect. So I work on this, this idea of six steps to success when we're doing any workspace adoption. And it, it's something you'll see from probably quite a lot of resellers. And it's about assessing and planning and understanding why you are trying to do what you're doing, um, understanding your user behaviors, and then planning for something that you can deliver against those business objectives and user requirements as well. And basically doing that from assessment, design, build, test, transition, which is quite key. So if you can't support it from day one, you've got a big issue. Um, and then deployment as well. So you need to know how to support it before you deploy it. Otherwise, you're going to really become unstuck. So assess. If we ignore assessment from an analytical perspective to start off with, um, and we look at it from the reasons why you're actually doing this in the first place. So I'd like to think you've probably done a business case, and I'd like to think you've thought about the business objectives and things that you're trying to achieve by doing virtualization of the workspace. So for example, centralizing everything so it's more secure, more manageable, whether it's down to potential cost sa savings as well over the term of a five-year contract, whatever it might be. But understanding why you're doing this virtual workspace is crucial. So when you come to do a benefits realization afterwards, if you don't know why you were doing it in the first place, and it's purely just to replace PCs, it might not be the best approach of, of, of delivering it out to your users. Also, clearly define um, the deliverables and objectives from a business perspective and from an IT strategy. So if you've got a mobility strategy for IT, how does that map to your business strategies as well? Is it all about cost savings and efficiencies, business continuity? Is it being able to work from home when there's a bad storm, all that kind of things? Can you do all that kind of stuff as well? Is it for all your users in your organization, or is it for key users as well? So the main thing there might be you're picking out specific areas of your business that would benefit more from a virtualized workspace than others, more mobile users potentially, people that need to work from home or from different geographies, but have everything centralized and managed and auditable. One of the things that's quite key is understanding what applications you have, which we'll come to in a moment, but where the hell the media is and the licenses because if you've got to install something that you've had maybe for seven, eight years, the chances are you may not actually have the installation media anymore. That company may have gone bust, and you've got no way of getting it. So how do you then transition that from your physical world to the virtual world if you haven't got that kind of uh, information? Are you replacing endpoints? That's on there for, for one reason, one reason only. And in my experience, moving somebody from a fat client PC that's, say, eight or nine years old on their desk, moving them to a virtual workspace, but keeping that PC in maybe just turning it into a thin client by using some conversion software is great for IT and cost savings, but from an end user's perspective, they still see the same thing on the desk. And if you're just delivering a virtual desktop, that desktop might actually be exactly the same. So they're not going to see any difference. They're going to think you've made no changes. So we need to bear that in mind as well. 
Um, are you capable of supporting it? Do you need to prove the platform once it's implemented? Do you need to benchmark before, during, and after? Which is quite crucial as well for benefits realization. And training. That's not necessarily training for IT, but training for your users. Are you moving from Windows 7 to 8 to 10, whatever it might be? Are you moving Office from 2010 to 2016? Do we need to get those users trained in some kind of meaningful way to actually use the software and the environment efficiently? So on assessment, this is a, a snippet from Lakeside Systrack. Um, and this just basically shows the user experience on an existing environment before they've been virtualized. Red being a poor user experience, orange being good, and light green being good, sorry, and then dark green being excellent. The reason I put this on here is that if you don't know what your current user experience is, and you can benchmark it, then when you deliver your virtual workspace, how do you know if it's any better? And if it's not the same or better, then you're failing your end users. So you need to be able to benchmark that, show it, and sh show where the improvements have been made to your execs when they've spent a, a lot of money, potentially, to get this implemented. Understand the existing impact points. Understanding where CPU constraints are, disk constraints, whether a user's having a lot of application faults. Knowing all that information, one, helps you build a business case if you haven't already got one in place. But secondly, knowing it during your design phase allows you to ensure that your virtualization in the hardware underneath it or your instances in the public cloud are the right size for your end users to consume. So you don't want to be giving somebody something that only provides X amount of memory and X amount of CPU if they need double that amount. It's just, just crazy. And if you take an idea of people like me, I use a MacBook day to day, then I've got a solid state disk dedicated to me, I've got a GPU dedicated to me, and I've also got a pretty decent processor dedicated to me. You move me into a virtual world, I'm probably quite an expensive user to deliver that same hardware to. Whether I need it or not is another question, and which is where this data that you can get out of these tool sets is extremely valuable. Understanding key user issues as well. You'll have VIP users, the people that complain the most. As an example on here, there's a user that's using 458% more CPU than they have available to them. May not be the right thing to move them to a virtual world. It might be, it might not be. They might actually benefit from um, a dedicated cartridge on like a HP Moonshot, for example, or a, a workstation blade, and actually run um, a, a physical instance on that host to give them more CPU, more memory, and more performance, rather than a shared model on a, on a virtualization approach. From a disk perspective with IOPS and averages, that user there, 2,168 average IOPS, they want an SSD. They need that SSD performance. They're asking for a lot more storage than what they have today from a, from a performance perspective. We've got to use this data to right-size the platform. Understanding logons, profiles, GPOs, it's one of the main things that everyone says that when you move to a virtual world, it will be quicker to log on to. Only if you fix the mess you have in Active Directory or remove the mess in Active Directory and replace it with a UEM product. This customer at this time, or my home lab in this instance, the, the GPO times are fairly reasonable-ish. Um, the profile is the issue. They've got bloated profiles. There's, there's basically cookies all over the place. There's thousands of files. It's not large profiles. It's lots of files to migrate over as you log on. And that will impact your log-on time. So knowing that thing and fixing it as you move into the virtual world is quite key. Because when you make that first log-on, that first time as that user when you've been migrated, it's quick, it's efficient, it's snappy. You're not getting the same poor experience you've had from, for the last few years. One key thing as well is understanding if you have laptop users and PC users that have had the ability to store data locally, where the hell are you going to put it when you move to a virtual world? Because you need to put it on a SAN. And if your SAN can't accommodate for this example here is 152 terabytes of data, where's it going to go? Public cloud maybe? OneDrive? Whatever it might be? Or you have to buy an extra few dish shelves on your SAN? I don't know. We need to think about that as well if you're going fully virtual. If you're not, you probably don't need to worry too much. Software. What's used, what's not used. This is actually an extract from a live customer data because I don't have 3,000 software packages to even install if I wanted to. Um, 3,465 packages, 2,155 of them were never used in 60 days across the organization. Removing things that have device drivers potentially, IE extensions that aren't required, the, the drivers that are things like the compact or HP devices, Bluetooth drivers, all that kind of stuff. And we managed to get that down to 107 required software packages for this customer which from a support perspective is great, it's standardized, it's nice and easy, there's less things to worry about. But then also from a, an application compatibility perspective, you can then run a compatibility exercise against those packages and not all of the 3,000 and up, which will cost you a lot of money. Do not size on averages. If you do an average across your estate, and you say as an example here, there's say, an, IOPS there, there's an average user IOP of 48 IOPS in Office 1. 
and let's say there's 200 users in there. You'll size for that, times it by the number of users. We need this much size of SAM. Boot, logon storms, anomalies, workload changes. Before you know it, your environment is not performing the way it should be, and then you need to invest more money to deliver more IOPS. As an example there, you want to be looking at the peaks and troughs, and you want to be looking around the 80th to the 90th percentile, potentially, to, to ensure you're delivering the right amount of growth in the platform and the unknowns that may occur throughout the year. Because in this data set, it's only 60 days. And obviously, there's a lot more days in the year that something may happen that we're not aware of. Next step, design and plan. Resource oversubscription. Do not oversubscript, uh, oversubscribe your resources in a VDI or server-based computing environment too much. Because if you don't, you're going to struggle if you, if you oversubscribe it. A 5 to 1 or a 10 to 1 P core to vCPU mapping is where people generally start without analytics for VDI or uh, server-based computing workloads. And with regards to your uh, memory, my advice is look at things like Windows 7, minimum of 2.5 gig, Windows 10, and minimum of 3 gig before you even put your applications on there. Then size further upon that. Do not oversubscribe your memory at all, is my advice on that one. Pulled versus dedicated. Dedicated takes up more resources. Um, so you, there may be circumstances you need dedicated. But if you look at things like app layering, you look at things around um, UEM and things, do you need dedicated anymore? Maybe, maybe not. Just look at those as well. Because if you can centralize and do single image management, it's a lot easier for you to support. Test. Most overlooked area of any workspace adoption is the testing. It, it's a, a time-consuming thing. And you need to test, test, and test again. And just opening the application is not good enough. Double-clicking it, yes, it opens perfect. It connects to the database, fantastic, amazing. You come and do your first order on the new system, and it fails, or it takes 10 seconds longer than it used to. You need to get champion users on there, test it. If you have a monitoring tool set, like I've mentioned earlier, you can benchmark it, and you can see how long it's actually taking in comparison to the other workloads. And that's going to be quite key, when you can basically prove to the users it's, it's, it's better. In deploy, I'm being quick, so I've only got a couple of minutes. Um, run a phased adoption. Don't just roll out in the masses. Pick areas of your business where you want to be able to make a, a benefit into them sooner rather than later. Also, maybe pick your, your harder users to adopt. Don't just shy away from them, because if you get them on board, the rest of the organization is going to be a hell of a lot easier. A lot of people go in and do, right, we're going to pick, as for argument's sake, a healthcare organization, we're going to pick A&E. Because putting this in A&E in a virtual workspace has massive benefits, and it's fairly easy as well. But then you go into radiology, where you need GPUs and things, and you start to struggle. Because you may not know the way the radiology application works, you may not know about GPUs properly, and you need to basically get those guys on first, because everyone else is easier. If you can prove it in the hardest way, the project will go a lot further. There's a lot of deployments of virtual workspaces out there for organizations of hundreds of thousands of size that have a pocket for 50 users, because they struggle to get them onboarded properly. If you do it properly, and you take those harder users, you work through your issues, you'll be able to get them onboarded and get through your organization and realize those benefits quicker as well. Don't bring existing profiles across, ever, ever. Start afresh, because you don't want to bring that legacy rubbish from your old environment into the new. This is a new, shiny platform. You don't want the issues of large profiles or little things they've done wrong in the environment that may cause issues moving forward. We need to just, just not bring those over. And run an internal marketing campaign. Sell it to your end users. I work for a reseller. My job as a solutions architect is to come in and help the sales guy sell the benefits of this to you. Why not use, as an example, a reseller to help you sell that into your end users? Why don't you get them to sell it into your business? Key takeaways, run assessment, understand your user needs, benchmarking, um, test, test, test again, phased adoption, and then identify your VIP users. And silly things can help. So if you've got a user that's quite got a picture of a kid on the side of a PC, and this is an example from real life, so, so don't laugh if you can help it, the kid on the side of the PC, and it basically, we took that away, they had nowhere to put it, and everything was rubbish, no matter what happened. So we gave them a frame. £1.50 frame from B&M, she was happy. And that's it from me, because the time's up. So thank you very much.